So shall we make a start then? Will you will you have to stand away? Do you want your video on? Yeah. In a minute when I see who is on. They can hear you now. Right. I hope every, I've just turned up my volume a bit. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, welcome to our webinar on acupuncture and chronic pain. Is if you're not if you're not speaking, do you think you could make sure that you're muted? Because there's some there's some strange noises coming through at the moment. Uh, okay, right. As a uh, looks like a picture of a dog in the Scottish Highlands. Yeah. Right, I'll start off again. So welcome to our webinar on acupuncture and chronic pain. I'm Mark, Mark Bovey, until recently, research manager of the British Acupuncture Council. So the council is the leading body for professional acupuncturists in the UK. We work mainly in private practice, about 10% in the NHS, um, but GPs can refer patients to us because of our accreditation by the Professional Standards Authority. We're holding this meeting now because NICE last week recommended acupuncture for chronic pain. NICE is the body that guides the NHS on which treatments <laughs> to use or not use. And it's, it's important to bear in mind when looking at their guidelines that these were produced in response to overuse of opioids and other painkillers. So, in fact, it only recommended four things, exercise, two sorts of psychological therapies, antidepressants like amitriptyline and acupuncture. And so this meant that the whole vast swathe of drugs that's been used for chronic pain for some time, things like opioids, but also paracetamol, um, anti-inflammatories uh, are no longer recommended here. The, the acupuncture that they're talking about can be of any sort. So it could be for a traditional Chinese medicine framework, which is what most of our members would operate under, or it could be more of a Western framework. And it, uh, it's also important to note that the, it, it um, restricts the amount of acupuncture you can have to five hours in total. And how that's delivered is, is up to whoever's, uh, whoever's doing it. So it could be, for instance, 10 treatments of half an hour each. <clears throat> now, this, I, sh I should remind the, or tell the audience at this point that this webinar is being recorded. Um, also to say that this is a question and answer webinar. So I'm not gonna go on any longer. Um, it's essentially about you asking questions and getting answers from the panel um, and there are two different ways to do this. You can either write questions into the chat um, and you, you can see the symbol uh, for the chat down at the bottom of your Zoom screen or you can raise your electronic hand um, and then you'll be able to, so that would flag up to me and then we can unmute you and you could put your question actually directly uh, speak it to a member of the panel. So we've got, a, we've got a, an expert panel here today, um, three eminent acupuncturists, and I'm now going to hand over to them to introduce themselves. So Richard, since you're looking at me from the screen, <laughs> do you want to start off? So can Richard Yes, please? thank you. Yeah, okay. The system wasn't allowing me to unmute there. Um, okay. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Richard Blackwell, and I'm principal of the Northern College of Acupuncture in York. So we're one of the uh, institutions that train acupuncturists. They do a three-year degree course to, uh, to train as acupuncturists and work very hard. That's me. Um, shall I hand over to Angie? Yes, please. Hi, 
I'll start again now I've unmuted myself. <laughs> Hi there, everybody. Good that you're all here. Uh, my name's Angela Hicks, and I'm joint principal of the College of Integrated Chinese Medicine that teaches acupuncture. We're in Reading, and I've been an acupuncturist since 1976. It's about 45 years, and I also uh, supervise in the teaching clinic and I mean the college is similar to Richard's College. Thank you. And now I pass on to Felicity. Hi everybody and thank you for coming tonight. It's going to be very interesting. Um, I've been in practice since 1980 and just like the, the other two people on this panel um, involved in education for a long time. I set up a school in Chinese medicine and then moved it in 1997 into a university, into University of Westminster. Uh, and so been involved in teaching and particularly clinical teaching for a long time. I have now left that, so I'm no longer um, within the teaching group, but I still uh, am involved in teaching and education within the British, Ac British Acupuncture Council. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So that's our panel today. Um, and we, we collected a few questions beforehand, and I'm going to start off with those. Uh, um, and the, the first question is about CRPS, chronic regional pain syndrome. Uh, and the question was, um, I'm very wary of needling into the affected area. Um, could could we have comments from the panel, please, on that? And who'd like to take that one to start? Felicity, do you want to do it since yes, you're I'll, I'll on start the screen on this already? One. Um, uh, thank you to the person who, who sent this in to us, and uh, I can understand this is you know a very um, difficult condition to to have. Um, it's interesting Chinese medicine because it does come out with a, quite a different diagnostic method. And I think it's important to realize it, that Chinese medicine has its own understanding of physiology and pathology within the body uh, and therefore comes to a diagnosis that can be very different from the biomedical diagnosis. Now, in terms of needling into areas, um, one of the things that we often do is treat treat along the line of energy. It doesn't mean you actually have to needle into the area itself. Uh, and so Chinese medicine will very often in acupuncture, we will needle, you know, if you have, a, it's, it's, it's why it's that strange thing, isn't it? You have a headache, so we'll put a needle in your feet. And people think, what, what, what are my feet got to do with my headache? Um, and so that will be an aspect that we will treat. With this particular condition, if people are too sensitive to have needles, then we've got a number of techniques. We might treat on the opposite side, um, the same area, if it's, you know, in your elbow on one side, we'll treat on the elbow on the other, or, or go down to the leg. Or the other one is actually using ear acupuncture, um, which is known to have some very powerful effects as well. So in terms of your, your, that particular issue about not needling into the area, um, then that would be something we would be able to deal with quite happily. Yeah. Uh, and there, there are a couple of other questions about CRPS. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you want to take those as well, Felicity, or pass them on. Um, so one of them is, uh, is, is someone who talks specifically about her daughter having had acupuncture for CRPS uh, and that she was worse after that. And we, we don't know any more details about the situation. Um, so mm. and her question was, was the acupuncture in some way done wrongly? Mm. Not knowing the, the actual situation of what happened, that's a very difficult thing to answer. Um, it is like anything, sometimes it might be that the first time you treat, there can be a bad reaction. It's very, very rare for that to happen, actually, in my experience. It's very rare. I don't know if the rest of the panel would say the same. I agree. Um, but, but every time you treat, you're using the information you get from the previous time. So if that happens, you're not going to carry on doing the same sort of treatment. But without, without specifics, it's really hard to know. Um, we, we all learn as we go along. And listening to patients is a really important part of it. We do try to bring patients into our work so that 
knowing what makes things better or worse. You know, is it better with heat or cold? Is it better in the morning or the evening? All of those bits of information will help us. You know, did it get worse immediately after treatment and then got better, you know, by the next day or the other way around? Sometimes when we treat, you can have this sort of effect on the, on the endorphins in a way, a bit like a painkiller, and you can have relief. But sometimes it might be only for about 24 hours. And then what we're trying to get in Chinese medicine is, is getting underneath the problem. Yeah, you know, what, is, what, is, what is behind it? How do we work with both the, the pain and the symptoms and also the underlying condition? So, yeah, we, we, working with patients is probably one of the most important things. Okay, thank you. And I, and I, I, I know these, um, these sorts of discussions are difficult when you're doing them over Zoom and there's not the facility to have a... Sort of direct dialogue going mm. on so yeah. the person can't gaff, come back and say oh but blah, blah, blah. so um thank you for that felicity um there a couple more questions one of which is again specifically about crps and the other is sort of related and i thought i might start with the more general question to richard perhaps first of all which is um uh, and, and it was part of um, a series of questions and comments from someone and one of her questions was um, how experienced are you all with the less well-known chronic pain conditions and so and, a follow, and there's a related question that's come in here is do any of the experts here today have experience of the use of acupuncture in patients with CRPS i.e. complex regional pain syndrome if so, I'd be very interested to know what particular considerations there are when treating these patients. Also, what might CRPS patients need to know ahead of such treatment? Um, but perhaps, if, Richard, if you want to address the more general one, and then other people can other people can chip in. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so, acupuncturists, a typical acupuncturist at least half of their patients will be presenting with chronic pain, either on its own or in combination with other things. So um, we, we do have a lot of experience of treating all sorts of pain conditions. Uh, it depends, you know, it's not quite clear from the question which rare conditions the person has in mind. And there certainly are rare conditions which have come into my treatment room. and. Um, I trained in medicine before I trained in acupuncture and it's still perfectly possible for people to arrive with things that I've not heard of and uh, you know it's, there are conditions which affect one person in 10 million or even less than that so um, in those cases the practitioner will obviously um, use their resources to discover more you talk to their colleagues and as Felicity was saying actually we'll work with the patient because Many of you on this call will know that patients often become experts on their own conditions with these sorts of problems. Um, but the other thing to say is that, as has already been said, Chinese medicine works in a rather different way diagnostically. So whatever your biomedical disease label is, the acupuncturist is still going to ask you lots of questions and be interested in the overall functioning of your system mentally, physically and emotionally and will form uh, a, an overall diagnosis of what's going on with you based on all of that information. Um, so it's, it's, we kind of take a bigger picture than just focusing in on the syndromes and the specific, or rather on the symptoms and the specific um, medical diagnosis. Um, it's important that we understand that and know about it, but it, it's not directly what would inform the way that we treat. So that, that's a sort of attempt to answer the general question. Um, and then uh, regional pain syndrome, I've treated not many cases of this actually, but I have treated a couple of cases. And it is unusual in that people with this condition often the, air, the affected limb or area is often so sensitive that even just touch is extremely painful. So this is a situation where I would not needle the area if it was that sensitive. Um, and as has already been said, we can use 
things like points in the ear, we can use scalp acupuncture, we can treat the opposite side of the body. There's a lot of crossover in the nervous system between the two sides. So you can treat the opposite side and get an effect. That's sometimes used in other contexts, such as phantom limb pain as well. You know, when a person's had an amputation and sometimes the, the, they experience pain where the amputated limb would be. Um, and obviously you can't treat the area that's affected in that case, but you can treat the opposite side of the body or again do ear acupuncture and so on. So one of the nice things about our, our treatment approach is there's lots of different options available within it and it can be tailored to the individual and their condition. I don't know if that picks up all of those questions, Mark. That sounds pretty good, Richard. Yeah, um, th th there is another one on CRPS, but, but I think, um, and maybe I'll pass this to Angie, I, cause I, but, but anyone can chip in. Because this one, although it specifically mentions CRPS, I think it has wider connotations. Because um, it's, it's asking, having had CRPS for 16 years, how can five hours of acupuncture possibly have any effect? So this is, and, and this would, I guess, would apply equally to, to any a serious long-term condition. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say something about there's a long tradition of Chinese medicine treating joint problems and pain. And uh, I think Richard Felicity and I have all been in China and Mark probably as well. And we know that the first place any patient at least used to go when I was there was if they had a pain condition was the acupuncturist because they knew how well acupuncture could treat these conditions. Um, so I just want to say that. Um, in terms of talking about five hours worth of treatment, sometimes it would take more than five hours worth of treatment. I think you're probably thinking about 10 treatments half an hour each, which is a certain amount that people uh, have suggested to them. Sometimes it, it, if, it's, if it's been going on for a very long time and it's very chronic, it could take more than that. On the other hand, if something's been going on, you never quite know how long something's going to take to treat. So I don't think we can always know. I had somebody come recently um, who had excruciating pain in the hip that had had come on after an injury. Now it had it wasn't actually called CRPS, but if it I think that's it's quite difficult to diagnose, but it was absolutely excruciating. And I used needles that were at it was in the hip and I used needles that were in the foot and by the knee, nothing near the hip. And within just five treatments that pain had gone away but it was caught very early um, and before it was even di diagnosed with a western medicine diagnosis but I know that it was absolutely um, very very painful and sensitive so there's no way of being able to say it's going to take that number of hours um, but I think that is a set amount of prescription that somebody will get. And often by that time, people will know if it's on its way to getting better. I think that's more uh, the case. And I just pass on to Richard and Felicity if they've got any more to add to that. Felicity has, I think, yes. Um, I, I think that's right. One of the things we have to do, and it's partly because it is private medicine, we're careful about taking people on for long, long periods of time. Um, without the patient realizing that's what they need to do. And so I would hope that with that five hours, we get some idea what you were just saying, Angie, as to whether it was gonna have any impact. And it might be it has, you know, it's all right for a day, it's all right for a couple of days, the pain comes back. That's always a good sign that there is something happening, but we do limit ourselves into how many treatments we will give in the first instance, because we don't want to go on treating people forever with, without any results. But it's a difficult, it's a difficult call. And I have to say, it's one of the hardest ones when people ask, how long is this going to take? Yeah. Don't know. Don't know how long it's going to take. I, I do think for your the caller who said he's had they've, they've had this problem for 16 years, mm -hmm. that would take a while. 
I don't think that's going to get better in five hours of treatment, I really have to say. And the person really does have to commit to longer than that. And that's where the difficulty comes in, isn't it? Because it is, you know, you have, it has to be paid for in that way, whereas we're used to the National Health Service where it's not paid for. But, you know, if you can get five hours of treatment on the NHS, then it's a good beginning. You know, it's really good indicator as to whether we can help. So in that way, we're really, you know, quite happy that this is happening because it gives people at least a chance to, to try it out and see what it's like. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, panel, for that. I've got one question from the beginning um, that's about acupuncture for osteoarthritis in the knees. And after that, I, I then want to go to Louise, who's got a hand up to ask a question directly. Um, so if someone would like to take the one, that this, this is the question, um, very keen to hear if acupuncture can help with osteoarthritis in the knees. So, so all of the panel are jumping up and down wanting to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got in first. The, and the reason yeah. is that osteoarthritis in the knees is one of the things we really like treating. <laughs> so, yes. You know, there are some things that come through my door and I think, I might be able to help this, but I, I might not. You know, the results are a bit mixed with this condition. And there are some things that people come in with and you just think, oh, good. <laughs> I'm really confident I can help this. And osteoarthritis of the knees is definitely one of those. Yeah. So, yes, acupuncture is really helpful for that. Felicity? There's been some very good research also on it. Um, yes. The German study, yeah, of osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, so it's it's useful while you know often the research is not is not always that conclusive I mean you read that if anyone's read the nice report on the on the chronic pain um, there's there's good evidence in there but it's not always conclusive but the OA knee is one of the ones that has had some very good results so yeah we feel more confident don't we to say yeah 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 come along that's fine <laughs> we can deal with it yeah yes. yeah okay um Louise, I'm going to ask you to unmute now. I think if I... Hmm. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi, Louise. Hi. Yeah. Um, right, so um, I'm the one who asked the question. It was my daughter who um, had ah. the acupuncture okay. in the hand for CRPF. Right. So, um, oh, okay. Yeah, so it actually made it spread. She only had one session. And she did mention to the acupuncturist that she was very sensitive on the hand, even though he then proceeded to put needles in the hand. Um, but this actually caused it to spread. So obviously she wouldn't actually go to any more sessions. So I would like her to possibly try it again, but obviously she is very nervous. And how do we go about to make sure if she do agree that you know, are we going to somebody, you know, the correct person and to make sure, you know, this don't happen again? Yeah. Uh, I, hi, Louise. Hi. I, I'm, I'm really sad that that happened, especially as you already said about the, the hand. Um, I think this, we, our webinar is on behalf of the British Acupuncture Council. Obviously, we don't know who the acupuncturist was um, who mm -hmm. treated your daughter, but in general, if you go to somebody who is a member of, the, of this professional body, they will listen to you. We are very patient-centered in general, and we do listen to what um, the patient said, and if you're with your daughter, what you say. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, other than, cause, because we, we don't know any more of the circumstances, it's it's difficult to say anything, but I don't think most acupuncturists would go ahead and put needles in the hand if they were told that it was really yeah. painful. Um, mm -hmm. That's all I could say. Yeah, uh, Richard yeah. and Felicity might have more to say about that. And I think if you were if you were calling a, a practitioner and was just trying to check them out for your mother, then possibly ask them you know I've been told that ear acupuncture and scalp acupuncture and approaches like that might be useful do you use those approaches yeah. I think that would kind of clue you into whether the person had the kind of range of treatment yeah. options that you need mm. um, also the um, CRPS actually spread into my daughter's foot 
So um, she got it up both um, hands and arms and actually in the foot as well. So mm. if we were to proceed with the acupuncture, would, it, would they just concentrate maybe on one area to try and relieve the pain for the foot and the arms and hands together? Or would it be a case of it's like going to different areas for the diff, you know, relating to the different parts of the body? I think Felicity wants Can to Can I answer yeah. that one? Um, Louise, as you're saying that, then it starts to look as if it's something more systemic. The, the, the minute it's something in the hand and the foot. And so probably one would be looking much more at treating the underlying yeah. pattern that's allowing that to happen rather than going directly to sort of a pain relief of that particular area. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We talk about, about things in this way, doing local treatments to where the pain is, but also, but also looking at, this, at the pattern. And that's the beauty, I think, of, of a Chinese medical diagnosis because it does understand that. So that would be then talking to your daughter about a lot of other signs and symptoms they might have. You know, we go into what is their digestive function? Yeah, what is their circulatory function? Yeah, we would look, be taking the pulse, looking at the tongue and trying to come to a much more holistic picture of what's going on. Uh, so mm -hmm. the, the minute you give me that piece of information, you know, it's moved somewhere else, then that starts to trigger a quite a different approach mm -hmm. and a different diagnosis from, just treating where the pain is yeah so where, so where would I go from there then because obviously it's to do CRPS to do with the central nervous system yeah. so so where would I go from there you know to try and possibly go to somebody to you know try and to like look at all different things well I think depending on where you are because the best thing is to go to somebody who's local so it's easier for yeah it's easy mm -hmm. to get to I think that's one of the important things is contact the British Acupuncture Council and find a member of the profession who's nearby, yeah, who's yeah. able to do this. That's your, mm -hmm. that's your best way forward. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Louise. My, Thank you. Yeah, Take care. I've got my daughter with me. Do you want to ask anything else? I'm just not quite sure whilst it could be because I've had my circulation, pulse, everything's checked. There's not actually anything physically wrong. And there's no damage to my actual body itself. Well, that, there's a lot of medical conditions that um, are difficult to diagnose, you know, and which are not well understood. It doesn't mean there isn't something actually, you know, something physical mm -hmm. going on somewhere. Uh, yeah. It's just not well understood. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the, that's where sometimes Chinese medicine really comes in with an advantage because we do have this different way of looking at the situation. So, you know, we would make a diagnosis of what, what functions seem to be working well and what we're working less well in you as a person overall and, uh, and try and balance and correct that. So that's a very different way of going at it, which doesn't actually require us to know in a kind of biomedical sense, you know, exactly which bit of chemistry is going wrong or which bit of the nervous system is going wrong or, or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. we'll treat the whole, the whole person and look for that to start to help your, your body to heal and to correct itself. Okay. Um, okay. One of the ways of thinking about all of this is that things go wrong with our bodies, emotions and minds all the time. Um, but usually they heal. And so one of the things we're trying to do with acupuncture is to kick those self-healing mechanisms into action. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's what we'd be trying to do. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. So, Good luck. Yeah. I hope it goes well. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Louise. I think our next question is this one. Um, if we get referrals from doctors, how do we go about getting financially subsidised? That's a tricky one. Who <laughs> <laughs> would like to take that one? Well, at the moment, that's, that's often problematic, to be honest. There aren't um, well-established direct processes for individual practitioners to hook into NHS funding. Um, 
So one of the things that we're hoping may come out of these new guidelines is that practitioners will be able to offer a service to the local clinical commissioning groups, which are the groups of GPs that decide where to spend the NHS's money. Um, and if we can establish relationships like that, then it will be easier for patients to get referred. Um, and you know, once that's set up, the doctor refers you and the acupuncturist bills the NHS, basically. And it's obvious, yeah, as you would understand, it's a little bit more bureaucratic than that, but <laughs> that's the gist of it. Um, so yeah, at the moment, I think um, you would be lucky to find a, a, an individual practitioner who already has that kind of arrangement set up, to be honest. Just to add one thing, meantime, before all that happens, each, Felicity, Richard and myself all um, are at teaching clinics, all have teaching clinics in our colleges that give reduced rate treatments. Um, so going along to one of the acupuncture colleges where those treatments are carried out is another option um, for the moment. That's not... Uh, it's not completely on the NHS or any, it's not free, but it is um, less than half price for a lot of them, as far as I know. It is certainly at this college and I'm seeing Felicity and Richard yeah. nodding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah much cheaper point. than one-to-one. -one much, much practice. cheaper. Yeah. Uh, and all of the students are mature students who've had a lot of life um, uh, experience who can, um, you know, they're not kind of young, very young, they're, they're kind of in their 30s, 40s, whatever, and they are very, very good with patients and they're all supervised by the staff at the college. So that is another option. I noticed uh, one of our fellow principals just put in the chat, the more people ask their GPs for this, the more quickly the LHS is likely to set it up. So that's a good yeah, point. yeah, true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, and I think if you if you look at the um, commentary that came out from all kinds of groups, including GPs and pharmacists and, and patient um, patient groups, um, after the draft version of these these guidelines, then there's very much a recurring theme, which is how on earth is the NHS going to be able to afford to pay for this kind of thing. Um, and and and, they're, and looking at their responses, their their stock answer seems to be that um, it will require some extra training. Um, that they're going to save some money by cutting back on other services, but I think it's still very unclear how um, they would be afford able to afford to pay for extra acupuncture services. It's a tricky one with all these things because in yeah. the long term, they should save money on on. I was drugs, just thinking that. But yeah. Not only on the drugs which they won't be prescribing, but on treating the side effects of the drugs that they're not prescribing. And one of the key reasons that NICE have made this recommendation, that most of the drugs are not recommended, is that the, in the long term, the harmful effects outweigh the benefits. That's what they're saying. And those are things that the NHS then has to pick up and treat and pay for. So, you know, they would save money, but the problem is you have to put some startup money into these things, don't you, to get a new service going. And it might be some years before you start to see the financial benefit. So, um, so there's a bit of persuasion to do there. Felicity. Yeah. I do know that um, years ago at the Marlborough Health Centre, they did a, a study of, of reducing their, their drug bill. They had acupuncturists, massage practitioners, counsellors in the clinic, and they did reduce their, their costs a lot. Yeah. Uh, it was always a little bit difficult for them to know whether they had a particular group of patients who were happy to be doing that, yeah, to be, to be having other treatments other than drugs, but they did find that it did reduce them a lot. So there is a cost of if effectiveness in there. And the NICE guidelines, I think, say that, don't they? That they're seeing yeah. that there yeah. is a cost. You know, they've looked at that. Yeah. It's not just efficacy, it's, it's effectiveness, is the cost effectiveness. And that's what yeah. they come out with, which is also where they get the five hours of treatment from. 
Mm. Yeah, so that's that's the other part. Um, most of the studies on chronic pain, um, the results are done over a period of, you know, four or eight weeks with either one treatment a week or two treatments a week. Uh, that's where they take the results from. So, you know, people are getting results in that length of time. And so that costing is, is where it's coming from. So quite a complicated thing that NICE have done there. And an encouraging thing, which a lot of the research shows, is if you follow people up for a year or a year and a half, two years, the benefit, even though they might have had a course of 10 treatments, which might have only taken two or three months to do, they're still showing benefit from the treatment a long time afterwards. Mm -hmm. Now, in practice, I like with chronic pain, I quite often would want to keep seeing somebody perhaps not every week, but maybe every three or four weeks, so as a sort of maintenance treatment. And I think that's best of all. But it is one of the things that weighs into the cost effectiveness analysis is that the acupuncture can have benefits which last quite a long time after the treatment has been given. Um, and that's an interesting contrast with the drug treatments, which of course generally with the treatments for pain or the anti-inflammatories and so on, when you stop taking them, the effect wears off very quickly. Yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> On to our next question. Is there any evidence for acupuncture helping the pain of axial spondyloarthritis, including ankylosing spondylitis? Uh, as the NICE guidance, and this is, this is quite an interesting one, this, the NICE guidance for low back pain and the guidance for axial SPA, don't recommend it, but they do recommend it for chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And 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 it, and it, again, if you if you look at if you look into the details of what Nice says in this guideline, and in the the comments and responses to them, you can see that there's certainly going to be instances where there's overlap between um, for for someone who has some sort of pain that's already covered by an existing NICE guideline, like low back pain, but also um, it's covered by this chronic, chronic um, pain guideline. So on the one hand, it can be that NICE is not recommending acupuncture. On the other hand, that they are recommending acupuncture. And what they say under these circumstances is that it's up to the professional judgment of <laughs> of the people who are making decisions about this thing. Um, I don't know what the panel has to say about that. I think um, I'll just say a little bit. I'm not sure, of course, about um, the evidence, but there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that um, and experience from, from ourselves, but also from other acupuncturists that acupuncture can have quite a good effect on things like ankylosing spondylitis. Um, and rather than the whole spine seizing up, that it can be kept moving and can have, uh, I've seen people have um, continued movement where they might not have expected, expected it. However, can't say that for every single person. And I don't really know if there's and Mark will know about this, if there's even been um, any uh, research into actual ankylosing spondylitis or the axial. Yeah, uh, I, some, but not much. Yeah. We, 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 I, we, did, we, we have had sort of ongoing dialogue at times with uh, people in the ankylosing spondylitis society because they were doing they were doing some research themselves at one point and so there was some amount of collaboration but in terms of the sort of research that NICE looks at very little yeah yeah obviously a very different kettle of fish when you're looking at back pain where we all say that yeah acupuncture is one of the really good things for low back pain and yet NICE originally recommended it in 2008-9 and then took it away again in 2016. So it's all a question of what evidence you look at and how you decide to interpret it. I think one of the things that's interesting just generally about reducing what's known as, a, as an inflammatory process. 
and that acupuncture does have have interesting effects on that. And if you look at the sort of the, the way acupuncture is seen to work from a more biomedical point of view, um, and that it's stimulating through stimulating, um, it's considered stimulating nerve endings, et cetera, in, in muscles and tissues, you know, the, there's this release of neurochemicals, you know, things like endorphins, et cetera. So, um, you know, that's the thing that helps us sort of consider, you know, yes, I will, you know, it is worth trying acupuncture for something like that. Um, obviously, it does depend on how long and how much damage has happened. Can you can you reduce the damage that's been done already by the by the inflammatory condition? Um, sometimes, not necessarily, but you can stop things getting worse. Uh, but you know that's why we often take things on on that basis that you know we do understand that that sort of chemical process that goes on with the with the central nervous system, etc., from use of acupuncture. Yeah, and I, I, I think that Felicity makes a very good point here that so you might not get a complete cure, but you might actually have relief. And the amount mm. of relief you have is enough to make it worthwhile. Mm. Um, so, so I think that needs considering too. If you've had something for many, many years, um, you're not necessarily going to get 100% better, but you might, if you even if you get 20% better that's a big step forward and so I, I think it's it's being us as acupuncturists being clear with the, with you as patients um, to say this is what we don't quite know exactly what to expect but we maybe expect so and so and you thinking well I think it's worth my while trying that. Okay we've got a few questions on fibromyalgia um so two of them are quite similar and basically saying is acupuncture helpful for fibromyalgia is it any good for fibromyalgia pain and there's there's one yeah there's one that's a bit more than that which says can acupuncture cure fibromyalgia rather than just treat the symptoms i have received treatment which helps temporarily but the effects last only a few weeks. Who'd like to start on that one? <laughs> um, I don't mind if... Oh, okay, go ahead, Angie. So, well, well, I was just going... I'm, I'm kind of drawing a certain amount of experience from the teaching mm -hmm. clinic um, uh, where we have had quite a lot of patients who've had fibromyalgia, which followed somebody giving a talk to the Fibromyalgia Society in the local area. Um, but a lot of those patients did get relief from their fibromyalgia. And we are looking not at, because it, it is a very systemic um, problem rather than because trying to, you can't expect to take pain away from so many different areas of the body, but, but we are looking at what's underneath this and what's the cause of this. And everybody has different causes. It's not like there's one, um, only one cause in Chinese medicine terms. They might be overlapping, they might be similar, but we are treating every single patient as an individual and looking at what that individual needs. Um, so there's, there's often um, a lot that can be done, um, but obviously we can't promise to be able to help every single person that comes for acupuncture. Um, so it looks like Felicity's got more to say, so I'll pass on to um, you. Steve. I think fibromyalgia is interesting. They've done some interesting studies of using trigger point acupuncture because the mm -hmm. muscle, those muscle tensions that build up can be relieved through trigger points and i know that it's it's quite detailed to, to work with trying to find out where all the different trigger points are and and there's been some research that's saying yes trigger points do work for it um, and then other people saying no it doesn't but but i think the take what you're saying angie is that yes there's the pain part of it yeah where trigger points can work uh, that's to do with finding points that actually affect distal points, points not where the actual pain is, but near it, that will affect that sort of muscle yeah. tension that's formed in that area. But there's also the systemic work that has to happen. Uh, 
So it's, it's again, the whole body being treated. And, and that's where I think the Chinese diagnosis comes in quite well, because there are different ideas there about it, uh, depending on the nature of the pain. So it's not just, we're making a diagnosis that's quite, we're taking into account it's fibromyalgia, but also looking at what it is from a Chinese point of view and what the nature of the pain is, what makes it better or worse, what can you do that helps it, uh, Lots of yeah. in it. It's also interesting if you look at the nice guidelines, the other things they're referring, like exercise. Um, in fact, exercise, especially for fibromyalgia, is more about movement is needed, not exercise as such. I mean, a lot of people with fibromyalgia can't do exercise in that sort of in the way one would one would think, but movement is really important. So people are now saying what's more important is to keep moving, not necessarily to do exercise. And then all the other things they're talking about with chronic pain that we have to take into account. There's the whole, the whole emotional side of what's going on uh, with with chronic pain that that needs that needs discussion and talk and help with and and thinking through. Uh, so so it's a it's a, it's really interesting. I think fibromyalgia of all of them sort of covers all those areas that NICE are talking about rather than just using drugs. Yeah, they're saying use acupuncture, use exercise, use yeah, use therapies. Yeah, talking therapies as well. And just to add that um, in the chat, Alan Longcroft has just posted a link to a British Acupuncture Council documentary, a 30-minute documentary, which covers a lot of the points that we're discussing this evening. So uh, people might want to just... Um, well, actually, yeah. you, you can click on that link now and then save the web page for later if you want. Mm -hmm. Good. I, and I just add on to that uh, the conversation we've just been having that you need to you need to consider what alternatives they are there are for for the problem that you've got. So I've, I've got a patient who comes or primarily came uh, with chronic fatigue syndrome. She also gets a lot of pain all over the place and would probably be diagnosed also with fibromyalgia, and she comes very regularly she gets relief only temporarily but she says it's better than nothing there's not there's there's nothing else that gives me that relief so i keep coming back and having acupuncture very good point mark yeah i had several patients with trigeminal neuralgia which is a, ner a nerve pain in the face it's like having toothache in your face mm. um, and again usually they would need to keep coming back every few weeks for treatment but considered it to be absolutely worthwhile. Mm. Okay, <clears throat> I've got a question here. Well, there are a couple of related questions, I think, because um, there, there was one that we that we picked up um, beforehand, which was if you're having treatment and, and the pain, you're having treatment for pain and the pain persists, what do you do? Um, do you have do you have more needles or do you start again? Yes. Um, and and the, the related question here is, how would a patient slash the person giving acupuncture know whether acupuncture just isn't working for that person and isn't going to help them or whether it's just that they need more time, i.e. More, more than the prescribed five hours? So you've got the whole sort of time, treatments, dose and whatever. Mm. Um, I think that's the that one I alluded to before is, is we do limit ourselves usually as to how many treatments we will do. Sometimes it, you do get a sense it might take longer, but you have to work together with the patient. And you do, because it's private medicine, we do tend to limit what we'll do with no results. But it is a matter of, you know, if you get some results, that changes, yeah? The person, the patient then can start to feel that it's going to have some impact. Uh, I think that's the most difficult question of all. And one I, you know, you get asked and it's a really hard one to answer. All you can do is say, let's let's do this. 
And the other bit is just saying it's something, yes, a lot of people treat. It's something that's in all the classic, you know, the Chinese medicine texts, for instance. As we were saying before, OA knee, yes, please come and we'll, we'll treat it. Or low back pain is one that we commonly do. So there are certain things that, yes, you know, you feel, yes, that's fine. You know, acupuncture is going to be really good for and others. But, you know, you may don't have the experience, but we will talk to colleagues, et cetera, about it and see what experience other people have and ideas of what. As to more needles, that's an interesting one. I would hope what you do that all doctors will do is if something's not working, you go back to your diagnosis. You know, have I got my diagnosis right here? That's what you do, yeah? Uh, it's the same in, in every medicine is you look at it, you know, am I not quite understanding something? And sometimes it'll be a little bit more information a patient will give you, just helps you go, ah, that's, that's what might be behind it. That's, that's important. Yeah, and they're often questions. That's why in Chinese medicine, we ask some quite odd questions, yeah? You know, we'll ask things like, you know, sweating. Do you sweat in the day? Do you sweat at night? We ask about hot and cold. We ask about your energy levels. And we'll ask things like, you know, how would you describe yourself emotionally? You know, one of those might be something that will come into, a, in, into effect. You know, that'll be something we'll take into account. So you go back to your diagnosis when things are not working. Yeah, uh, just to say a little bit more, Chinese medicine does not separate the mind from the body. That is something that the two come together all the time. So you, you can't say this is physical, this is mental and emotional. They, the, they, we are whole human beings. We've talked about being holistic already in terms of treatment. We can't, we can't say we're only going to treat your body without hoping expecting there to be effects on your mind and emotions as well um, and just about the question of putting more needles in sometimes more more needles doesn't necessarily make a better treatment um, more needles uh, so we're not going to frantically keep shift, shoving more needles in hoping it I don't know what the, the quite what the question was about but we're certainly not going to do that it's where we put the needles and how we use the needles that's the important thing. And I will reiterate what Felicity just said, which is we'll go back to the diagnosis and look at the diagnosis uh, in order to maybe do, make a little shift in the diagnosis if, if it hasn't worked from what we've been doing. But certainly it's not necessarily more needles. Lovely. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, one on migraines. Straightforward. How can acupuncture help people with migraines? Well, this is exactly the same as the osteoarthritis of the knees questions. And yes. This is one of the other. <laughs> this is another one of the acupuncturist's favourite diagnoses, because we know we know that nearly all the migraine patients we treat will benefit from acupuncture. Yeah. Um, Angie, um, I can just say yes and agree that. Um, Acupuncture is great for migraines. Um, and I'll pass on to Felicity and she might say the same thing. <laughs> I just want to say one thing, though, is that sometimes, in my experience, I don't know about others, is that sometimes acupuncture can trigger a migraine. Oh, yeah. And I think that's something we have to make sure we say to patients, yeah, if, and, and to the person mm. who's asking that question. It can sometimes happen. And there's something about migraine it, it, from, from the Chinese perspective you really have to get the balance of what we would call what state the energy and the and the blood is in the body. You know, and this is remember using these terms, chi, energy, and blood is a, coming from a very Chinese point of view. It's not chi, blood is not the same as, as a Western medicine concept of blood. So I just want to add that little bit in, unless people know already about acupuncture and Chinese medicine. And so sometimes at the beginning, when you first start you don't always get it right. You don't read your patient right. And so it can cause it. The only thing is it doesn't seem to be a, like a long-term thing from that other patient who said they had treatment and it spread and it got worse. I don't find that, but I do find that sometimes the, the, the migraine can get worse. Um, it's trying to follow through sometimes. And, and there's a really, with trying to treat migraine, you're trying to treat at the time of the migraine, there's the aura of the migraine you know, that comes first. And then treating behind when, when the person hasn't got the migraine. And so you're doing very different treatments on, you know, between those when a person hasn't got the migraine and when they have got the migraine. And yet you have to work that out. 
and understanding some of the symptoms of it, like, you know, the aura, is it is it a sudden onset migraine or does it take time to come on? All of those things are important questions to us. So whereas I think, yeah, and there's very good research for treating migraine, um, you know, there, there are caveats mm. always. I, I would always add in on that into the person. So don't get thrown if you do have an exacerbation in that first treatment, first couple of treatments. Yeah, it usually settles down after that. Yeah. yeah. Long, actually long term, mm. uh, then the results are really yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and, um, and actually that's one of the other conditions that the NICE guidelines do recommend acupuncture for. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. We've got, um, we've got a question. Yeah, somebody asked a question and then somebody else in the chat has answered it, perhaps better than we can. Um, <laughs> So the question is, is acupuncture effective for those with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? And, um, and then someone else has answered this, I have EDS and find acupuncture amazing for it. For me personally, when the practitioner needles directly into the pain, it can cause a flare up, but apparently this doesn't happen to everyone. And there are lots of other options. And she's talking about other acupuncture options like distal needling, I not, not locally into where the pain is cupping which is which is using um sort of glass or or plastic bamboo um hemispherical cups onto the area and evacuating the air out of them so they suck on or moxa which is burning a particular herb um so th thank you very much to both for that the question and the person who answered it i don't know if if anyone else has got any particular experience with that syndrome at all I, I haven't myself no 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 okay um just to uh, say i just say yeah. i haven't got experience and i and looks like none of us have with that syndrome but mm. we would still be able to treat the patient i just yeah. think that we we because it's chinese medicine and because we have a different way of diagnosing people if somebody mm. came along presenting with that condition we would look at how it is for that particular patient with that condition and mm. we would treat that patient and there there's no reason why we have we don't have to know the name of something in order to treat it well mm. absolutely um i just want to bring up something that sort of came up there when you talked about cupping um mark mm. and and one of the things that we try to do working with patients is give patients things that they might be able to do for themselves at home. And one of the cl classic ones that I think Chinese medicine is really good at is what we call cold conditions, pain due to coldness. It's a really different pain from an inflammatory pain, you know, which has got redness and swelling. Cold is a sort of contracting, you know, localized pain that is better with heat. And Chinese medicine acupuncture is always called acupuncture and moxibustion. And moxibustion involves the burning of a, of a herb. It's, it's mm -hmm. mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris. You can either put a lump of it on the needle or give a person like a long stick, yeah, that they might use to burn like a cigar stick, yeah, and put close to it. And so, you know, that's something we're always trying to do is find what can I give you that you can do yourself? So it could be massaging a point, um, ear seeds that we'll put in that you can press on that will impact on the part of the body giving moxa or various sorts of wonderful heat techniques that are around now you know i i sort of practice with lots of different ones that have patients practicing with lots of them you know they're little round ones that you can strip off and it gives an intense heat onto a point for instance that you can use you know yourself so i think that's something that we always work on as well we always have our little other other things that we try and work on and I do like conditions that are you know are, are cold conditions yeah uh, because we have the thing called moxibustion that we can use. I, I think that's um, I think yes I think that's a very important point Felicity um, and and it one, one of the one of the one of the comments I noted from I can't remember whether it was the British medical um society or, or exactly but, but it was from some branch of orthodox medicine uh to, to nice about the recent chronic pain guidelines 
was in respect of acupuncture was uh, we don't think much of this acupuncture because it's just it might take away it might alleviate the symptoms and so on but what surely we're looking at these days is trying to increase patient self-sufficiency and reliance and resilience and so on um, and I think that they're so wide of the mark in respect of acupuncture because there are a lot of things that we do that very much try to instill that in patients. It's not just about giving them the treatment when they're there. It's also about trying to get them to, to change behavior, to change behaviors yeah. and, and to give them things that they can do to help them to help them with that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. I, yeah. I mean, lifestyle is part of Chinese medicine and Chinese medicine lifestyle advice or things like Felicity was talking about and Mark's talking about that is all very very much part of what we do. Yes things like I was just thinking of things like um, Tai Chi for instance. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. can be fantastic um, for, for helping people move and you can do that sort of thing even if you're sitting in you know in a chair and can't move at all. Mm -hmm. There are certain Tai Chi movements that you can do that can be absolutely fantastic. Um, and diet as well, you know, getting into the systemic side of it, you know, there's a way of looking at diet and what diet people should be having. Um, yeah. And that gets tailored to the individual yeah. and a very different approach from a, a, a Western approach to diet. It's quite a different. Sometimes it clashes and we have to work with that. Um, mm. But, you know, other times it's, yeah, it's really effective. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Okay. So, uh, uh, oh yes, interesting you say that because there's uh, there's a question here um, and the person says I find exercise almost impossible with my fibromyalgia, and I have and I have chronic fatigue and sleep issues as well. So, as you're saying, I think something like um, Tai Chi could be really good, or Qigong exercises could mm. be really good. They can be very very simple, very simple movements, and they can do yeah, they can help. Yeah. They can help sleep uh, really effectively sometimes, very gentle movements, as Liz is saying, yeah. And also looking at, for, looking at diet for those kind of conditions can be quite helpful too. So moving on, the next question is, how effective is acupuncture for mild cerebral palsy? Um, well, so cerebral palsy is an example of a situation where there is some damage, there is injury, um, which is probably not going to be entirely reversible. But it may be possible with acupuncture to help the body to kind of work around the injury a bit more, help the nervous system to work around it. So. Um, worth a try i think particularly if there are problems with muscle spasms something like that mm. acupuncture can be very good to help with some of those sorts of symptoms um, I, I know uh, one of our colleagues who specializes in treatment to children he um he used to treat children with down syndrome and you know he would say you know that there's there's a genetic there's a chromosomal problem with down syndrome and acupuncture isn't going to change your genetic material. But he still found that it helped um, these kids to, 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 to function as well as they could with their condition. I think that would be the way he would put it. I remember at our teaching clinic, it's many years ago, treating somebody um, who came with cerebral palsy and and I remember he found the treatment fantastic it was a, a you know an older person um and he found it fantastic it was it was you know hard working you know around it trying to get the needles in etc with the with the spasm going on but um yeah I remember him him saying that it was great he really looked forward to his treatments yeah it wasn't it wasn't curing anything but it did alleviate some of the symptoms that he had so uh, you know, on the basis of that, I would I would probably do that. Um, again, you need to be you think of where you might be able to go 
and if you're talk if you have got cerebral palsy depend this person's asking mild cerebral palsy is how much um you know can they can they move because some of us will be working in places that are not um easily accessible mm -hmm. yeah for people with any disability so just just take you know check that out with with people but that's where teaching clinics are very good because they they have got those yeah the accessibility which is really useful uh, thank you uh, and, and i guess i guess that wouldn't fit into nice's definition of chronic primary pain in that they're uh, they're talking about um chronic pain that doesn't have a, a specific underlying condition that you think is what's causing the pain or or it can be that that the person's having that amount of pain that seems to be out of proportion to the nature of the underlying condition um and there's possibly another couple of examples here so there's there's a one someone's asking about chronic interstitial cystitis, cystitis pain. Is acupuncture likely to improve that? Um, I don't have a lot of experience with that personally. No. I think. Um, no, I don't either. Um, Nor me. But we know that. I don't know if this is the same, really. We know how good acupuncture can be with cystitis itself, but I don't think that is possibly what is being talked yeah, about. Yeah, it's a bit different. Mm -hmm. I, yes. I, I, there, there, is, I, there, there is a <laughs> there is a particular acupuncturist member of the British Acupuncture Council who has somewhat specialised oh, yes. in yeah. treating interstitial cystitis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and there is a bit of research on it to say that acupuncture can be helpful. Um, and so possibly if this person would would like to leave a contact then we could perhaps um put put them in touch with that person mm, yeah, and they could yeah. pursue it further um and the, yeah the other one i was looking at was um post herpetic neuralgia mm, nasty condition yeah mm. this is another example of a very painful condition um, so this is this is um, after a person has had shingles, and the the rash and so on clears, but the nerve pain remains. Um, well, I can only speak from my personal experience of this one. Uh, others might know about the research evidence on this. Very mixed results. I've is my experience. Sometimes people respond quite well, you know, in getting a, a, a really useful reduction in the pain. Sometimes this is very difficult to treat in my experience. Um, Felicity? Yeah, I would say exactly the same. Um, I think the longer somebody's had it, the harder it is yeah. to treat. I think the sooner you can get on to treating shingles in the acute stage is, yeah. is, in, yep. is something which isn't what the NICE guidelines are about, but I would be saying, you know, mm. get for some acupuncture at that point rather than waiting and certainly in China you know that's one of the things is treated immediately yeah, um, absolutely. shingles with with acupuncture you know <clears throat> in the acute stage um, afterwards yeah I have mixed results with it yeah. yeah and but treating shingles at that acute stage is very successful mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. yeah yeah you have to treat often though Yes, you know you are going to have to be treating possibly daily every other day. It's not it's not a once a week, and it's it's going to be yeah better. I think that's one that I would be saying you need to be coming daily or every other day. Yeah, or for a couple of weeks or so until it's for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. <clears throat> okay, right. Here's an interesting question: <clears throat> If a patient thinks acupuncture won't mm. work, but still tries it. By if they don't buy into it, does that make a difference to the effectiveness of the acupuncture for that person? For example, in therapies such as CBT, patients have to be committed to it for it to be successful. They have to buy into the treatment for it to have the desired impact. Does that play a part in acupuncture? Gosh, I, I'd, I'm happy to answer that because I do think there is a therapeutic relationship that if there's a good relationship and there's trust, it really helps. However, 
acupuncture works on animals and acupuncture works yeah. on children and it works very well and that that there is you know that is obviously it works above and beyond the therapeutic relationship so mm -hmm. that that's my answer to it mm -hmm. i i agree we take the fact that it works on animals and children and say therefore it's not important to buy into it um but yeah like any like anything there's a therapeutic relationship and also with needles it's why one of the things i don't like is somebody making an appointment for somebody else you know does that person want to come and really it's because you know putting needles in people is is breaking through that skin barrier is is you know an invasive technique you know you have to be happy for that to have to happen although people say they hate needles and still come for treatment and and they're fine mm -hmm. with it but you know we have to take that into account with acupuncture so um i think every in everything you need to to you know have build up a relationship with the practitioner i think that's important yeah 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 and it's um, it's, it's it's particularly rewarding yes <laughs> i have had patients who've come in and i distinctly remember a patient who i treated in the west midlands many years ago whose whose opening comment to me was i don't really believe in this stuff you know no. um, but but uh, and he had back pain and he came back the next week and it was those better already so, um, exactly. so that's that's particularly pleasurable yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but i think we did establish a, a relationship you know despite the fact that he was skeptical about what i was doing and maybe that was the key thing there yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. and just to say about um some people really don't like needles but other people a lot of people come away from acupuncture and they just really love the treatment and feel really good. And I think, I think we need to say both of those because people yeah. often feel very relaxed after treatment. They feel it makes them feel much better in themselves. Uh, so no matter what the actual treatment has been like and needles don't have to be too painful, but some people don't like them, but they often also feel good after a treatment. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're ne nearing the end of the questions. Um, <clears throat> so, are any of you dab hands with a laser? Not me. Oh. Did so yeah? So the question is: Did someone have experience with laser in the treatment of chronic pain? I know, I, I know that there's there's a a body a, a proportion of the research because sometimes sometimes laser is included in with acupuncture when yeah. they're reviewing research and sometimes it's excluded electroacupuncture is you usually included in with acupuncture though you could argue that it's a different thing um so i i personally don't have an experience with laser i don't think any of us do i have a, I have a, no. a, ger a german colleague who's a medical doctor as well as being an acupuncturist um, who lectures about laser, this is using laser on acupuncture points or on mm. painful areas and he lectures all around the world and absolutely swears by it um, but I, it's not an area that I know much about. I know quite a few people use it with children yes. because it's non-invasive yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah. but I, I don't yeah. have a personal experience of it I can't say no yeah. electroacupuncture was interesting wasn't it because I think the NICE guidelines showed that they didn't think electroacupuncture, if you looked at those, that research wasn't showing it was more beneficial, mm. yeah, to add electroacupuncture. But I think for most of, I mean, I don't know, I would use electroacupuncture for more acute pain than I would use it for chronic pain, yeah, if I'm using electroacupuncture. So mm. therefore, I don't think it's necessary within the chronic pain research they would have done, it's not it's not used as much, but um, certainly for acute pain, ac uh, electroacupuncture can be useful, yeah. Mm. Or, very, or very severe pain in any way uh, as, as well, I yeah. think I'd think about yeah. it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mentioned patients with trigeminal neuralgia earlier, and I think I treated both of the ones I was thinking of with electroacupuncture. Electro. Yeah. Mm. Um, so yes, yeah, severe pain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, uh, and, and perhaps lastly, um, someone who someone who posted questions beforehand 
Um, in fact, several questions and some comments as well. We've already we've we've done one of and, and those questions and comments seem to be more aimed at the NHS rather than at us as largely private practicing acupuncturists. Um, one of her other questions was, can you offer ongoing care um, for, for those people who, who won't ever recover from their, from their problem? Uh, but I'm, I, I, and I'm not sure whether it's particularly aimed at, will the NHS pay for someone to continue to have acupuncture forever and a day? Which yeah. is a different question. Yeah. Which we don't know the answer to, and at the moment um, it does not get um, paid for by the NHS. But mm. um, as private practitioners, we can treat them, but it's not um, obviously it is a private treatment, so there's going to be some payment. Yes, and I, I guess we oh, we've all treated a, a number of people who have conditions that aren't going to, they're not going to be cured in, in that sense. No, they're, they're always going to be suffering from them to a degree. And so you can help them live better with those conditions. And yeah. some of those people come long term to see you as well. It was, it was very interesting during lockdown um, when we weren't treating people and you know, you always wonder about those people that you you carry on seeing, like like once a month. You've treated them mm. at the beginning more often, and then you maintain their treatment once a month. And you often wonder, you know, do they still need this treatment? You know, what are we doing? Um, mm. But it was interesting during lockdown noticing how people did deteriorate after after that three four months of not yeah. of not having treatment. So. Yes. You know, I was sorry for them in that sense that they'd not had treatment or, you know, we were sending out moxa sticks and, and advice on how to, you know, what else they might be able to do, but it did need the treatment. And so, um, yeah, so I would say quite a lot of my patients are long term and I would mm -hmm. treat something like once a month. Yeah. yeah. Just, just to add um, that some people that might need treatment long term are people with cancer conditions and we treat cancer patients we don't treat cancer itself mm. but within a lot of hospitals our local hospital has something called my cancer my, my cancer my choices mm. and there's a lot of different yeah, 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 departments yeah. where they offer they offer treatment mm -hmm. and they ask for a donation only um, so that's quite common uh, that's particularly with that, but I think that more and more of those kind of situations are probably going to arise within hospitals. Yeah, yeah. So quite a few hospices, aren't there, that have yeah. acupuncture? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I know that Nice were talking about taking acupuncture off the guidelines for palliative care, but they didn't, did they? In the end, no, no. I think yeah. they kept yeah. it on. Yeah, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Ah. Right, there's another couple of questions come in. <laughs> there are a couple of comments first. Um, so one was, and this looks like looks looks like they're a practitioner themselves. I treated people who were sure it wouldn't work and been blown away when it actually did. Um, someone else responding to someone who said thank you um, for, for this in the explanations um, said. I didn't think acupuncture would work for me at all and did so much that now I'm studying to be an acupuncturist myself. <laughs> Very nice. Um, okay, so, so here's one. Many people who have CRPS are on disability payments. Has nice thought about how these people are expected to be expected to pay. We don't well, know. I mean, that's why they're recommending this 10 hours of treatment. So the implication is that the NHS should be willing to fund up to 10 hours of treatment for people. Five, five hours. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, yes, five, five hours. Five hours, maybe yeah, 10 treatments hours. with them. Maybe. 10, ten half-hour half hour. treatments, yes. Yeah. yeah, my bad, sorry, yeah. 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 Um, but as you've heard us say, we rather feel that might not be enough. That might be a starting point rather than a, a full solution. Yeah. So th th there's... 
this is it's early days in a way you know these recommendations obviously have only just come out um chronic pain is a huge problem as many of the people who are with us tonight will know mm -hmm. only too well sadly um and you know it affects millions of people and so there are real implications for the nhs in thinking about how it's going to follow through on this guidance and actually not just on acupuncture but exercise therapy would be another example and cbt and so on you know that the, there needs to be a a shifting of resource in the NHS towards other approaches that aren't just dependent upon giving people pills. Mm. And um, there is a kind of a groundswell that's going in that direction, but it, it's, it's, a, it's like trying to turn a super tanker. You know, it's not gonna happen overnight, I'm afraid. Yeah. I think I, I'm, I, I really, really long for the time that acupuncture is seen more widely for, for a lot of different conditions, because you probably mm. realize, uh, all you, you people as you're listening to us, that we know acupuncture can treat many, many different conditions. Um, and I long for the time that it is more available on the NHS. In hospitals in China, then they, a, a Western medical hospital will often have the acupuncture uh, department and vice versa, Chinese medicine hospital with a Western medicine department and the two are working hand in hand. And we, I think we all would like to see more of that happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. I thought we'd be there before my hair, hair started to turn grey, but it's taking longer than <laughs> I thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but, but um, it's also, in, I just want to say it's interesting uh, how many people are using acupuncture now as in dry needling like most osteopaths are using it, physios are using it, doctors are using it. They're finding that acupuncture, you know, the needling part of it works well. And I think we add that other, that other bit, which is the, the Chinese medical diagnosis on top of that as well. Yeah. Which you know, it's, a different, it's a different medical model and it's great to come in with something that's, that's different from the norm. I think it's really important that we, that we have different approaches to how the body works. Yeah, and, and having the Chinese medicine really deepens that treatment because we, we have a way of being able to see what's going on with somebody. So I do agree, yes, what's really going on. Okay, the late flurry and then I think we'll, mm. we'll call it a day and say no more after these because it's coming up to towards um, 8.30, which I think is probably a good stopping point. Um, so there was, I, I'm related to what you were ans answering before, are there any known plans for acupuncture to be offered more widely on the NHS? And any clues about how that might happen, who might give that treatment? Uh, and we, we've actually got a webinar next week with our members and part of that will be talking to them about how they might possibly be mobilizing themselves and their patients and, and lobbying um, local MPs and NHS to try and help turn the super tanker around that Richard was talking about earlier. Um, yeah. There's, there's one, I feel it should be available as it's all about patient choice. Absolutely. Yeah. Patients Absolutely. should be able to choose acupuncture as a treatment yeah. alongside their regular treatment. Yeah. Um, I'm a nurse in the NHS and I'm training in acupuncture now. I think acupuncture in the NHS is an evolving relationship and nice guidelines have just improved this relationship. <laughs> I hope that I'll be able to practice acupuncture for the GP surgery in which I work now once I'm qualified. Lots of patients need to request it from their GPs, yep. please. Mm. Right, definitely. Yeah, very well put. Here, here. Yeah. Um, uh, Ah, okay. So one last written one and then one where someone's going to ask you a question directly. Um, so the written one, and th this is from another practitioner. I've treated several cases of chronic interstitial cystitis with great success. Um, and also she's, she says laser treats acupuncture points as do other methods of stimulation. Right. Um, including Qi treatment applied without contact, which is, yeah, as, as someone said, is great, especially for children. children. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Now, can I see? Let's just see if I can find the hand up and unmute you. Um, oh. Um, Sharon, you had your hand up apparently, but you've now put it down. Uh, do, would you like to ask a question? You, you've got the floor. You've got the floor to yourself if you want to. Um, and somebody, this, will be, this will be our last question. Somebody might need to unmute Sharon. Oh yeah. I can see her reaching for her mute button. <laughs> There you go. I think you know. Yes. Are you unmuted? Yeah. yeah. Great. Yes. Yeah. Hi. I, I took my hand in because I was worried about um, the amount of time you had left. I didn't want to um, okay. run over. Um, part you two questions that you asked were parts of mine that I had submitted. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Um, which was rather a long, it, in my usual fashion, epic um, uh, post, but. And I think I've been living with CRPS for 31 years now. Um, mm. So I wouldn't expect acupuncture to, to do it. My experience of it was sadly not a good one, but I have had it for, for TMG um, at the uh, Royal London Integrated Hospital where you're based in fact. And um, it was incredibly good. I got a really good um, result from the, the, the 10 half hour sessions that I had. But at the end of it, the, the, the practitioner felt that I could do with more and suggested I go back to the consultant to discuss further, further sessions. The problem you have in the NHS is getting back to see consultants to get re referred back into the system again. So my question is going to be, you know, the reality of being referred to somebody in your discipline is going to be incredibly difficult and people who have chronic pain already struggle to get treatment and they struggle to get the right treatment. Um, you know, I, I've, I have my reservations about how patients are going to actually get into your service. Yeah. Um, because I would, I'm retired NHS, so I do understand how it works very well. Um, and I would have loved to have had more sessions, but I could not get back to see the consultant because once I had been sent into acupuncture, that was basically it for, for the pain management of my TMG. I, I just, before the panel, I, I just say that in the current guideline, there's what NICE calls a research recommendation. Um, they, they've got various research recommendations and one of them is about um, repeat, repeat courses of acupuncture. So um, they're saying they're not sure about the value of repeat courses over and above the, the five hours that they're recommending. Um, and so they want to do some research into it to see whether it's, whether it is something that they might recommend in future. Anyway, with that, over to the panel. Well, so I that kind of thing is helpful to us because that, that helps to free up some research funding potentially the fact mm. that there is a recommendation there to pursue that research yeah. and that you know i just think this is going to require a combined effort on the part of acupuncturists acupuncture researchers and patients mm -hmm. like sharon and many of the others who are with us tonight you know really working together to try and turn the nhs around and get these things available to the people who need them because the system is just not as responsive as it should be. Angie? Yeah, I, I can only say I agree with you and we need to find out more about the long-term, well, we know that long-term treatment can be good for patients, but we need to get that evidence base there um, and uh, so the NHS can find that out so that Sharon can get the help she needs. Mm -hmm. But this, this change in the NICE guidelines is a great beginning because if you're applying for research for anything, if you can say that, then you, you're partly the way there. Getting funding for research is, is diabolically difficult. Um, we're always being told we need to be doing more research, but not getting the, the, you know, the, the backing to do it. But this is, a, this is a beginning. And so I think with patients pushing as well, 
there's a there's you know there's a real shift within the health services to as to supporting patients and this is a great beginning for it so we you know we look forward to seeing how the health service is going to deal with this and so we have the same questions that some of you that Sharon mm -hmm. you have and some of the other patients that have come forward tonight we've got the same questions uh, and, and the one area of hope is that I think the NHS is becoming increasingly more patient-centered um, before at one time it was always the practitioners that got asked asked about things but nobody asked the patients and I think people are asking the patients much more now uh, and that's got to be a good sign because the patients will vote with their feet to have things like acupuncture I hope okay I think yes we all <laughs> hope thank you very much um thank you Sharon thank you everyone um who's attended the webinar today and and particularly those who, who've asked a question um and thank you indeed to our three panelists Angie Felicity and Richard um and is there anything else I should say and thank <laughs> you Mark <laughs> for setting up this webinar not at all not at all great right. yeah okay um, and thank everyone I... for coming as well yes yeah. yeah and I wish everyone a good evening um if you have any further questions that you'd like to ask or you'd like to pursue any of these um, any further, then please do get in touch with the British Acupuncture Council. Um, there's there's a, a team of people there who will respond to questions uh, and you can find contact details on the website if you just Google British Acupuncture Council. Yep. Thank you very much everyone and good night. Okay. Thanks Thank you. Bye all. Bye all.